This episode is brought to you with support from BetterHelp. What gets in the way of your happiness or achieving your goals? BetterHelp will assess your needs and match you with a licensed professional therapist so you can connect safely and privately within 48 hours of requesting an appointment. BetterHelp lets you connect one-to-one with a counselor online, and they're committed to helping you find the right counselor, so it's easy to switch therapists if it's not a good fit. Also, you have access to therapists with a broad range of expertise, some of which may not be easy to find near you. You can schedule weekly video or phone sessions, and everything you share is confidential. Also, you can send messages to your counselor anytime and get prompt and thoughtful responses. Start living a happier life today. Get 10% off your first month at BetterHelp.com slash Nocturne. Join over 1 million people who have taken charge of their mental health. Again, that's BetterHelp.com slash Nocturne. Thanks, BetterHelp. You're listening to Nocturne. I'm Vanessa Lowe. I was really nervous before. Me and my brothers were kind of scared and then It was time to go and they put our blindfolds on and I was kind of thinking to myself, like, what am I doing? Like, this is so weird. Um, And then we got in the car and they were driving and like taking all these turns. We had no idea where we were. And then they made us like hold hands, still blindfolded, hold hands and then walk up to this like hill where he dropped us off. And I remember like, I had no idea where we were. So I was like trying to peep through like the crack in my blindfold and look at the ground to see if I had any idea and I didn't. And then he took off the blindfold and I still had no idea where I was. And I was sort of thinking like, we're gonna be out here forever. Like this is gonna take us hours to get home. It was pretty quiet. We didn't really hear anything except for our own footsteps. And then occasionally my dad would make like a sound like he'd make like a monkey noise or like a scream and try to scare us a little bit. This is not what it sounds like, which to me is either the plot of a semi-scary horror movie or some deranged form of parental torture. Dropping is something that a lot of Dutch parents do with their kids. It's sort of a tradition, which I've never experienced anywhere else. Basically, parents blindfold your kids and put them into cars and drive them around and try to confuse them so they get lost. And then they leave them in the middle of the woods at like 2 a.m. and they let you find your way home. The kids are literally walking in the dark in the middle of nowhere. They are out there till they find their way back. So some droppings get out of hand and it takes forever for kids like maybe the whole night to get back to home base. That's the hardcore version of dropping, more common with older kids. And you know, sometimes they put like little notes in the trees to let them know that like you're going the right way. Or sometimes they just, like, let you fend for yourself and you have to find your way back. People say that it's because they want their kids to learn how to rely on themselves and be more independent. And instead of, like, running to your parents when you're afraid or don't know what to do, you have to figure out what to do yourself with the things that you have around you, with your environment. But I also just think that it's sometimes fun for parents to scare their kids. I know my dad had a lot of fun. I'm Maritza de Savern and Lohman. I'm 19 years old. My name is Diedrich Lohman. That's Maritza's dad. I am originally from the Netherlands, but I've been in the U.S. for the last, well, almost 20 years. From my perspective, it's a, a fun activity that I, you know, I really enjoyed when I was a kid. You know, it brings kind of the excitement of being dropped off somewhere in the dark. You don't know where, you have to find your own way home. It's something that, you know, usually droppings happen at like summer camps or, you know, kind of organized activities, mostly for teenagers. I was probably like nine or 10. I don't remember exactly how old I was, but um, 
yeah, I'm sure I was a teen. It's a bonding experience with, you know, with other kids, with friends. It's an adventure. I associate it with, you know, just having a, a really, a really good time. When Diederich did dropping as a kid, the practice had minimal adult involvement. I don't remember exactly what camp this was, but it was like a kind of a summer camp or a weekend camp. And we were basically taken, you know, out at night, it was dark, to a location that we didn't know. And we were with a group of people, all similar ages. And then we, you know, were basically dropped there in like a kind of a, a forested, woody area with the mission of finding our way back home. We were not equipped with like survival packages or, or anything like that. At the time, there were no cell phones. And so we really had very little in ways of communicating with, um, with anyone. When Americans hear about dropping, they're often alarmed. They can't imagine abandoning their kids in the dark woods. In fact, it seems like something you could get arrested for. We go to the Netherlands every summer because my dad's family lives there. Where we go for vacation in the summer in the Netherlands is an area that is fairly remote. There's farmland and then quite a, a significant amount of forest. I remember one time my dad and our family friend were driving us to one of the dropping sisters when I was like 13 or something like that. And there were six of us or something and we didn't all fit in the car. So there were three people in the, in the back seat, one person across laps and then two people like in the hatchback and we were all blindfolded. Then they like went around a bunch of times on a roundabout and did like a bunch of sharp right turns to confuse us and get us lost. And I remember we were on the roundabout, and it was like the fourth time we'd been around. And we hear sirens, and my dad's like, oh shit, it's the cops. And we get pulled over, and the cop comes up to us, and he like knocks on the window, and he's like, sir, you've circled this roundabout like four times, have you been drinking? And then he looks in the back and sees all these blindfolded kids, and there are way too many kids in the car. And he was like, what is going on here? And my dad was like, Officer, I'm so sorry, we're doing a dropping. And he like stops him and he's like, oh, I'm so sorry for interrupting. Like, you keep going, go on your way. That's how widely accepted the practice of dropping is in the Netherlands. It's a way when you, you meet new kids. So we went to high school and we didn't know the other kids and that's the thing to do. It's still the thing to do, to have this experience around that age when you go to a new group. We did it with like, if you start field hockey season, you just organize a dropping, and the parents all think it's fun. <laughs> I'm Pia De Jong. I'm 58. I live in Princeton, New Jersey, in the United States, and I'm Dutch. I'm from Holland, actually, the Netherlands. While dropping is often done in the context of Boy Scout-like activities, with education about reading a compass or navigating by the moon, that's not always the case. At its core, it's about challenging kids to be self-reliant and use their own ingenuity rather than rely on adults. And what makes it so interesting to me is that the Dutch use the archetypal boogeyman of the night as the foundation for this challenge. The purpose of the dropping is something like if you can make it there, you can make it anywhere. So if you find your way in the dark, in the woods, and after you've been scared and you're hungry, you're crying, you kind of won something. You just kind of learned to trust your inner force. You become, you know, a stronger person. You didn't know you had that energy or you didn't have that force. You know, you're like an adolescent and you're about to embark on the rest of your life and you have these tools inside you that you didn't know you had. Although that's not what happened for Pia. No, not at all, of course. <laughs> what I got out of this with this uh, kids that are like scared and, and, and already being homesick before and it was cold and it was like a little bit rainy. It was it's just not fun. And I just actually I got not like traumatized. I think that's a big word, but I still get this thing when I go in a place and I don't have any direction. I get like sweaty and I get like I panic. So I have this this lifelong fear of getting lost. I mean, yeah, let's listen to Pia again. In the dark, in the woods, and after you've been scared and you're hungry, you're crying, this is a scary thing. It works well for people who are like adventurous, but it's not for kids who are afraid. And it's definitely not for kids who, you know, who get lost uh, and, and it doesn't work out and they get like maybe traumatized. 
Yes, there definitely is an element of creating a little bit of discomfort for the kids, but in a way that, you know, that is um, that is fun for them. The younger kids don't usually get left in the forest without an adult somewhere nearby. But even still, the dark woods can be a harsh teacher. The first time my younger brother went, it was like seven or something like that. So it was, it was his first dropping. I remember my dad and our family friend, they drove us and they dropped us off in the middle of a cornfield. So we took off our blindfolds and there were like corn stalks like towering over us and we had no sense of direction because we were just in like thousands of corn stalks and we couldn't see anything and we were kind of like oh my god which way do we go and my dad had given us a clue to like use our compass and go north or something so we're trying to figure out which way to go and then all of a sudden we hear this like blood curdling scream from my dad and we all get so scared we like I remember we all just fell on top of each other. Like we were all just laying on the ground, like in between each other's legs and then got up and started like scrambling, but there was nowhere to run because there were corn socks everywhere. And then we start running and we're all like screaming. And then I see that my brother is like standing there bawling because he was so scared. And I went up to him and I was like, Nikita, it's gonna be okay. Like, it's just Papa, you know, it's just Papa. And I tried to calm him down because I'd been there too, you know, <laughs> but it didn't work. And my dad had to come get him and take him home because he couldn't do it anymore. <laughs> it took him like two years to do it again. He was really frightened. I did a dropping when I was 12 years old, with I think is typically the age when people are going on their first dropping. And in a, the occasion was also very typical for when to happen, which was the beginning of high school. And we had like a camp to get to know all the other children, which was about, say, an hour and a half driving from where we lived. So we had no idea where we were. It was really on the, on the verge of where the wood started. And one thing was maybe a little bit different because we had a nun with us. <laughs> and her name was Sister Nun Edel Trudis, which is a very Dutch old-fashioned name. And she had no idea what she was going into. So she was our teacher and she was going to be with us on this dropping. And we were just left there, as you do with a dropping, on their own to figure out where am I and where, what kind of, you know, direction do I go? So you start to talk to the others and deliberate and you hope somebody knows anything about the moon because they don't teach you <laughs> a thing of where the moon is and how to find any direction and of course this was before cell phones so nobody had any clue and we didn't even have a compass you know we just knew we had to go into this woods because you always have to go into the woods to find our way home and that's what we did and we stumbled on this path and after a while it's some kids really got like anxious and you know are we really on the right direction and it's dark and there was no light so we have no idea which path to go and, uh, and you get hungry and you get irritated and it's really a scary thing i remember this was in in, in september it's smelling the fall you know that, that sour smell and then thinking like oh my gosh it's gonna be you know it's gonna be raining maybe what's gonna happen here the person who was, you know, the, the most afraid actually turned out to be the nun. She had the least idea and she got the most scared of all of us. I don't know about you, but being lost in the woods at night and having an adult clearly spooked and at a loss as to what to do seems almost scarier than being there with just other kids. And so we went further and further, no path, and some kids started to cry. It was really scary. And then at some point we really had to decide and, you know, say like, okay, we are all lost here. We have no idea. And the nun started to sing <laughs> songs. It's like a <laughs> very Dutch song. It's something like, En van je hele hola houten moet erin. means something like, uh, keep calm and carry on. Like, don't give up with this kind of voice, this high soprano, <laughs> because she was used in singing in the church. I can still hear her singing that, that she was, she was frightened. She, had, she was just not used to probably being in the real world at all, let alone uh, in, the, in, in the night. 
I felt very, I felt scared, but I also felt very responsible for the other kids that were even more scared. And I felt already then, like, why the hell am I doing this? I think that was my basic feeling. Like, why do we do this? Why? I just want to be in my bed. I just want to get this over with. And this annoying feeling that I still get when you're lost, like, you know you're going in circles. And going there for like maybe the sixth time and thinking you recognize that one strange tree and that smell and there's some pine needle that you think you recognize like I've been here and it's an hour since then and I am not one step further than before. It took forever um, till like really after midnight before we were uh, basically found by somebody who was calling our names and because I think they got worried like where's these kids where's the nun and so that was my dropping experience that was Pia's first and last dropping sort of no I didn't do any drop this was it and uh, I think <laughs> it was enough for my the rest of my life and that well the, the other thing is I did do droppings in which is a little bit different maybe but uh, the, my father organized these things that, you know, he dropped us somewhere, but then he gave us like, it was like a, like a puzzle. He gave us little clues like, oh, and you go to this tr strange tree with this, you know, skewed branch. And then there was hidden something like a little note that he wrote for us, like a riddle. And so it was like, oh, go to where the river is. So you went to the river. So that was a lot of things we did as a kid, which were like that. But then I was guidance. When Diederik took his family to the wooded property in the Netherlands, he also wanted to provide his kids with the core of the dropping experience that he'd had as a child, but maybe without the chance of them never being seen again. I think I have actually been in a way more kind of careful than I was treated as a as a kid during droppings. I mean, times have also changed, right? I mean, when I was a kid in the 70s and early 80s, it was safer. Also, you know, when we started doing this, I think, you know, my kids were a little younger than I was when I started doing the droppings. And obviously, you know, there's a big difference between being 11 and being 14, 15. So the way I remember it, we were in a group, we were dropped somewhere and there were no adults in the immediate vicinity. Uh, the adults just kind of left and we had to find our, our way home. When we started doing this with, with our kids, you know, I didn't want to just leave them in the forest. And so what we ended up doing was a friend of mine and I would put kind of hints and clues, questions, etc., in the forest. Like, you know, there's this song by the Pet Shop Boys, Go West. And so the clue might be, you know, do as the Pet Shop Boys would do. And, you know, by giving them clues, it all almost became more like a treasure hunt with, you know, getting home as the ultimate prize. And we also would kind of follow them, put on dark clothes and, you know, try to kind of stay hidden in the forest, but follow them. And, you know, when they would go completely in the wrong direction, we would suddenly appear and like make scary noises in order to kind of make it clear to them that they had gone the wrong way. The idea is to, you know, make it hard enough that they aren't home within five minutes, but also make sure that they can find their way. But at the same time, making sure that they're not too comfortable. The woods were really cold and it was really dark, obviously. <laughs> and it was sort of quiet, but we were like deep in the forest, so the trees were really thick. So you could barely see like the light of the moon. The only light that we had was from our flashlights and that only went like a few feet in front of us. So it was like we were all um, holding hands or like holding the back of each other's sweaters and walking along and we couldn't really see anything except for our feet. My dad did tell us before he took off our blindfolds that he left just like little slips of paper stuck on branches and we had to walk like 50 feet. And if we hadn't found one of those papers, that meant that we were going the wrong way. So it was hard to find those papers and things in the trees, because um, it was so dark and we didn't have any other light. 
we knew that my dad was still there, just making sure that um, everything was fine, but we didn't see him at all. Um, he was just like hiding behind trees and sort of following us. So Dietrich made sure that nothing truly dangerous would happen, but that was actually small comfort to Maritza and the other kids. Honestly, I think knowing that he was somewhere behind the trees made me more scared than if he hadn't been there. Because obviously, like, the reason he was there was to make sure that we were safe and nothing happened. But that's not what it seemed like to us. The only time we really saw him in the woods was when he made some scary noise or, like, made a loud noise and we would jump and run. So it kind of made it worse having him there or it made it more nerve-wracking because he was sort of what we were running from. Most of the accounts of droppings I came across were positive, although if you search, you can find a few reports of kids getting hit by cars on the side of the road. So now there are more regulations in place, such as reflective vests and emergency phones for the kids. Even still, it's a beloved practice, and according to a New York Times article from a couple of years ago, droppings are such a normal part of Dutch childhood that many there are surprised to even be asked about it, assuming it's a common practice around the world. I have no idea how this started, who kind of came up with this idea of just dropping kids somewhere in the woods and leaving them there to to find their way back. I I can't say it's in your, you know, in our genes, but it's something that, you know, because a lot of kids have that experience and enjoy the experience, you know, it's something that becomes a tradition that you, you want to continue to, you know, kind of pass on to the next generation. You know, for me, that was kind of the main motivation. Most kids I know went through a dropping. I have three children and and they did droppings. It's that's and I feel a little bit guilty about them going through droppings because it's the same moment. High school started and I just forgot to ask, are you gonna do a dropping? But they did something similar. They put these kids in, in the middle of nowhere and had them find their way home. And they didn't like it either. I think they thought it was just kind of scary and they were completely wet and I think my oldest it took like all night for them to come home we were still living in in the Netherlands then in America if I let my kids do anything even watch a movie about like in going into the wild you have to sign off on that you know this is helicopter parent land in America they just want to control everything that goes into your child but in Holland they just don't do that Culture is something that you do because other people do that. So if everybody signs off that, you know, you know, for instance, at a school, you're like, oh, is it allowed for kids to get sexual teachings in a school? Then you just sign off because you do that because everybody does that. And if your kid goes to prom, which I find also a little bit of a strange experience, you you just let your kid go to prom. So in Holland, you don't think twice about it. It's just like they go to camp and they probably take care of your kids, your hope, and they're... You don't even think twice, but yeah, there will be a dropping. Of course there will be a dropping. When we finally, like near the end of the dropping, we knew where we were finally. Um, We recognized the property and we were like, oh yeah, we found it. And then all of a sudden we like hear these like really fast like steps behind us, like someone was running. And my dad starts like screaming like, so loud bloody murder and we all get so scared and like run as fast as we can all the way back to the house so that was it was terrifying i realized it was him after a few seconds but like that first second when i heard the footsteps like coming after me i was so scared it didn't matter who it was i was just it was the middle of the night and it was dark and my mom wasn't there so i just ran as fast as i could and i didn't look back and i mean in the back of my head i knew it was my dad but it was still scary. It didn't matter who it was. It was exhausting. I remember coming back, I went I went straight to bed. But it was worth it. You just drop kids in the woods and you make sure they don't die and then you just hope they find their own way. And this is a bit of a jokingly sad, but I think it's part of the Dutch culture that kids have to find their own way in life. And as parents, you're only there for such a short period. I think it's part of growing up that you know, I'm just, it's up to me and there are no parents. I think that's a valuable experience in a way. The whole point is that you're not with your parents and they don't tell you what to do. It's like, 
you're sort of getting a look into like independence. Because like you grow up and your parents are your support system and they're your security and they tell you what to do when you don't know what to do and they take that away from you. You're supposed to rely on yourself and make your own decisions. And being scared is part of it. Like if you're not scared, then honestly, it's not really fun. I think it's definitely an experience that nobody here in New Jersey can relate to. <laughs> it sort of makes me more interesting, I think. <laughs> but Dutch kids are more independent. They just become more self-sufficient. I'm completely ambivalent about this experience. So there's the American Pia since seven years talking, and there's the Dutch Pia who just didn't think, you know, twice about it. But I think it says really something about the Dutch culture that you are basically on your own in life and you have to figure out your own path. So in Holland, I think and whatever path in life you take will be your own responsibility, which is a good thing. I think American kids are, to my opinion, overprotected. So I think it would be good for American kids to, you know, to get a little bit loose of their parents. I don't disagree with that sentiment. But it would also take a lot for me to drop my now 15-year-old son in the woods in the middle of the night and say, good luck, see you later. But at the same time, I am aware that when I think about doing that, I get this sort of warm, excited tingle in my stomach and this deep sense that there's so much there to be gained by being lost in the woods at night. Where is the sweet spot between danger and the potential for incredible personal growth? Because of course, the dark woods are not just the dark woods. They're a metaphor for so much more. It's nice being able to say, like, oh yeah, I found my way back in the middle of the woods, in the middle of the night, like all by myself. I don't know, you feel accomplished. <laughs> and when I first heard about it, like I never thought that I would be able to do that. I thought that sounded crazy and I would be lost in the woods till like 6 a.m. And I did it and it was fine. And I realized that I could do like a lot more than I thought I could. You've been listening to Nocturne. I'm Vanessa Lowe. Nocturne is produced by me and was created by myself and Kent Sparling, who also composed the theme music. Thanks to BetterHelp for supporting Nocturne. For 10% off your first month, go to betterhelp.com slash nocturne. Connect one-on-one -on -one with the counselor online to get help and feel better. Again, that's betterhelp.com slash nocturne. Music in this episode is from Janet Fetter, Miles Boyson, Pollen Music Group, Kent Sparling, and Kid Otter. Nocturne is mainly supported by listeners like you, either on Patreon or PayPal. And I am so, so grateful for all of you who chip in whatever amount you can. Thank you. Very special thanks this month to Colleen Hamilton, Clayton Myers, and Nate Landon for supporting us at the Happy Possum level on Patreon. Find out how you can help keep the show going strong at nocturnepodcast.org support. Thanks so much for listening. Till next time, be well. <laughs>